Hello and welcome to Worship with Hounslow Methodist Church. Uh, I'm John Logan and uh, you're very welcome to join us in this act of worship this morning. We're going to be thinking about the theme, A Change of Mind. But first, some words to get us in the mood, to get us ready to worship God. So we're going to call ourselves to worship. Jesus tells us that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. So let us do that. Let us bring God our hearts, all our emotional ups and downs. Let us invite God into our souls, the very depths of who we are. Let us honour God with our minds in all our thinking and questions. Lord, as we gather in this place, May our worship bring joy to your heart. May your spirit breathe into our souls and may our word reshape, may your word reshape our thinking so that we might have the same mindset as Christ. Amen. to you.
And now we come to our prayers. First of all, a prayer of adoration, followed by praise and thanksgiving, and then confession and a reminder and assurance that we are forgiven. Let us pray. First of all, the prayer of adoration. God of all truth, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, you are the source of all positive change. You are the bringer of all lasting healing. You are the inspirer of all life-giving choices. You are the dismantler of all stubbornness. You are the provider of opportunities. So we worship and adore you with our hearts, our minds and our lives. Amen. And then for our praise and thanksgiving prayer, at the end of each line, you can join with me at home, wherever you are, with the phrase, and we thank you and praise you, and we thank and praise you. Patient and creative God, you offer us the opportunity to change, and we thank and praise you. You give us eyes to see where change is necessary, and we thank and praise you. You equip us to overcome the temptation not to change, and we thank and praise you. You inspire us with your word to encourage us to change, and we praise and thank you. You bless us with your love that changes everything, and we thank and praise you. In Jesus' name, we thank and praise you today and every day. Amen. And now for our prayer of confession. At the end of each sentence, could you join in as well with the words, please forgive us, please forgive us. Faithful God, when we are too proud or too stubborn to change our minds and our ways, please forgive us. When we make good choices, but then change our minds when things get tough, please forgive us. When we judge others when they change their minds and underestimate the courage it takes, please forgive us. When we believe it is too late to change and miss the opportunities we could embrace, please forgive us so that we may change for the better and for the right reasons in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, your forgiveness changes us. It changes our hearts, our minds and our lives. It changes our relationships, our judgments. Help us to trust that change, whether it happens quickly or slowly and surely, day by day. And reassure us of your love for all that you have made, shown to us in the life and death of your and resurrection of your Son and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we say the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
And now for the first of our readings, which comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 17, verses 1 to 7. There's a whole thing about striking water from the rock. It comes out a number of occasions in the Old Testament, and this is one of them. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarrelled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water and the people complained against Moses and said, why do you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children, our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, what shall I do with this people? They're almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarrelled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord not among us or not? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the scribes of the people came to him while he was teaching. And they asked him, by what authority do you do these things? And who gave you this authority? And Jesus said to them, I will also ask you a question. And if you answer it, then I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or, or was it from humans? And they argued with each other, saying, if we say from heaven, then he will say, well, why did you not believe him? But if we say from humans, then we're afraid of the crowd, for they thought John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, um, we we do not know. And he said to them, well, I won't tell you either by what authority I do these things. What do you think? A man had two sons and he went to the first and said to them, son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he replied to his father saying, I will not. But later, well, he changed his mind. And he went. The father went to the second son and said the same to him. And he said, yeah, Father, I will. But he did not. Now, which do you think of the two sons did the will of his father? And they said, the first. And then Jesus said to them, seriously, I tell you, the tax collectors and the sex workers, they are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. Now John came to you in injustice with righteousness, and you did not believe him. The tax collectors and the sex workers, they believed him. And even when you saw that, you did not change your minds and believe him.
you ever get frustrated by people who just ask you questions and they never give you answers? It was the philosopher Voltaire who said we ought to judge a person by his questions rather than his answers. In my rock and roll years of youth, uh, I was a, enjoyed the music of Manfred Mann and the Earth Band. And um, there's a song they sing with the words, they answer my questions with questions. It's certainly true of politicians these days. Will you ever get a straight answer to question? It's a really good question you've asked me. I wonder if you could answer my question first, or I wonder if we look at this in a different way. Questions sometimes can be frustrating, but you know, getting a question right is really important. If you're in school and you're teaching children, Children and teenagers are taught to ask good questions because if you get the right question, it gives you the key to the right answer. You can see sometimes people manipulate you with questions. Don't you think it's terrible that there's dog poo in the streets? Or don't you think it's terrible that so-and-so is allowed to do this, that, the other? And the reply is going to be, oh, absolutely, because that's what they want you to say. Getting the right question is important. 
it's known by pollsters all around. They go, they go for it. They go for it. They get, they can, they can make you say something you hadn't thought you meant by just phrasing a question the wrong way. Newspapers do it. The most notorious newspaper for doing this is is is, is the Daily Mail. But there are other papers that do it too. They and other questionnaires that try and um, make you think that you are going to say something that you're not really going to say. In Matthew's Gospel, where we heard our reading just now, all sorts of people asked Jesus questions. And both their questions and their answers are striking. There are many, many different questions asked of Jesus. Both John the Baptist and Pilate ask questions about Jesus's identity. John asks if he is in fact the one they've been waiting for. And Pilate asks if he is the king of the Jews. The Pharisees, scribes, Sadducees, chief priests and elders ask questions to try to trap Jesus. Why the disciples break the traditions of the elders for signs or proofs or about divorce or taxes or resurrection and the role of the commandments. And then by whose authority do you do the things you do? They're out to trap him. The disciples ask him questions. Who is the greatest among us? What good deed do we have to do to receive eternal life? They ask for a sign concerning Jesus' coming at the end of the age. And for every other question someone else follows, following Jesus asked, Peter would ask another, how often must I forgive? We, lift, we left everything for you, what do we get? The questions themselves are all revealing. With the exception of John, and perhaps ironically Pilate, the questions are all self-serving. What do I get? What's in it for me? Those who ask Jesus questions want to trap him or impress him or get something from him. And to every pointed question, Jesus offers an equally pointed answer, which reveals truth about the kingdom, the king and the kingdom's subjects. Here in this passage in Matthew 21, Jesus responds to the question put to him with a question of his own and a parable to illustrate it. The chief priests and elders ask Jesus where his authority comes from. His return question is about John the baptizer. He asks them if John's baptism came from heaven or from human mind. His question reverses the trap which the chief priests and elders are trying to set for Jesus. His accusers refuse to answer Jesus in case it incriminates them in the eyes of the crowds. So Jesus, in turn, doesn't answer their question about his authority either, but he does tell them a parable. The parable sets up a comparison of two sons, one who says he will do what his father asks but doesn't, with the one who says he won't but does. For every individual who hears this parable, the comparison forces them to ask themselves, which am I? Am I the son which presents himself as obedient while running around raising havoc? Or am I the daughter who to all appearances is the black sheep, but in the end does what is needed? Which am I? Which are you? There is an accusation in the parable. Some who claim to obey the father and obey the requirements of the law fail in actually actuality to do so. <coughs> Excuse me. Is this who we are as believers, as stewards, as preachers, church council members or Sunday school teachers? Which am I? There is also, again, a reversal of expectations in the parable. Those who are seen as the opposite, the antithesis of good believer, some who have failed to live in the right way, will be given entry to the kingdom of heaven first. Which are you? Jesus returns after telling the comparative parable to John. He returns accusation for accusation. For John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your mind and believe him. 
the one whose voice cried out in the wilderness, who was sent to prepare the way of the Lord, preaching repentance, went unrecognised and unbelieved. They didn't change their mind. Jesus tells us, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. Which am I? Which will you be? Will you be the one who changes your mind or just sticks with what's, what you said before? We may not be the chief priests and elders of Jesus' day, asking the Messiah accusing questions. Still, this parable could speak volumes to us. When you apply it to your own life, it has the ring of needing to challenge us into asking what we would do and what we could do, but we don't do in our lives. There's so much we want to do. You know, they, they, what's the phrase? The road to hell is paved with good intentions. There's so much that we all want to do, but we put off that we just don't do. We just don't do. But actually, will we do this? There's a Greek word, a Greek word, metanoia. And the Greek word literally means to turn around. So you're facing in one direction to turn around to the other direction. And that's what it's about. And we translate the word as repentance, as turning around from what you've done. And in the old Bible sense, it's turning away from sin into a new life with Jesus. Will you make that change? Will you metanoia? Will you turn around? Will you repent? Will you be someone who moves from one space to another Maybe it's time for us to all to think about what what things we need to change direction on, what things in our lives we need to do to help us to find a new way forward, to move with the spirit and to make positive decisions to follow Jesus positively. Issues of justice, issues of dignity, issues of solidarity and hope to follow our Lord Jesus Christ on that path. Not that one, that one. Amen.
Traditionally in October, we celebrate in so many areas Black History Month. It's a month where we can focus on the importance and significance of our Black brothers and sisters' history. So that's what we're going to do in our prayers today. And we're using prayers produced by the Church of England, prayers of intercession. So when I say, Lord, in your mercy, will you say, hear our prayer? Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray. God of all peoples, whose son reached across the ethnic boundaries between Samaritan, Roman and Jew, help us to break down the barriers in our communities, enable us to see the reality of racism and bigotry, and free us to challenge and uproot it from ourselves, our society and our world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all victims of racial hatred and discrimination, and we seek your protection for those affected in our churches, our schools, our places of work and our communities. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all in our world, of whatever race, who suffers the horror of modern slavery. Your son came to bring good news to the poor and freedom from the oppressed. We pray for all working to combat modern slavery and to end human trafficking for governments and agencies, for church and other faith leaders, for businesses, charities and individuals. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for ourselves. May we be voices against oppression and channels of transforming powers of the gospel. Open our hearts to all who suffer in our midst, but out of sight. Help us to work for a world where human beings are valued, where no one is enslaved and no one used against their will for another's pleasure or need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray that we might know the power of reconciliation wherever there is division between us and others because of our race or inequality of ethnicity. We pray that we may be led to reconciliation. We pray for all who work to bring communities together in ways that are just and equal for all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we pray for rec reconciliation, we also pray for restoration. We pray for those whose spirits and communities have been weighed down by racism. Guide us as we strive to ensure everyone has equal dignity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. Oh Lord my God
that when I think that God his Son not sparing sent him to die, I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sing As we go out into another week, um, let's let's go out knowing that God goes with us and that we can choose to make that metanoia path to change round, change direction. And, you know, we can do it as much as we need to. We don't have to do it once. We can keep changing direction. And that's a pretty good thing to know about our relationship with God. And may you be blessed as this week goes. But first, a few words of blessing. Be encouraged. Go from this place united in Christ, comforted by his love, sharing his spirit, shaped by his mindset, as humble servant leaders, bring glory to God the Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. And the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with us all, now and evermore. Amen.